for a start with the session. Uh, I have, of course, the chairperson here, uh, Professor Vijay Lakshmi. I have uh, Dr. Vaishali and Dr. Siddharth uh, as the co-convener and the moderators. Uh, I think we'll go on with the first talk. Uh, the first talk is Amblyopia Mythbusters and Evidence-Based Uh, just a second, uh, we'll have the, okay, so we'll just have the keynote first. Uh, okay, okay. So, uh, so uh, ma'am is of course uh, heading and uh, has been a mentor, a teacher for teachers who are currently teaching strabismus. She has been uh, uh, leading with examples with some outstanding work for over I, I would say 30 to 40 years since I've been seeing her uh, like I said almost everybody here has sometime or the other directly or indirectly been her student uh, she it's always a pleasure meeting and listening to ma'am uh, she'll be giving her keynote address on prescribing spectacles to children uh, very uh, it's going to be a good afternoon. When uh, Namrata asked me, select a common topic, madam, for AAOS. So I thought maybe this may be appropriate as an experienced one, what exactly that I can convey to the uh, junior persons, or uh, I was expecting more junior fellows here to uh, know about the facts. So what is it? We all know spectacles children is a very good uh, method for correcting refractive errors. But it's not only for improving the visual acuity, but it also helps in developing the visual system on the whole. And uh, uh, giving prescription is not only the numbers, as what uh, we all think. Decision on the numbers is very uh, easy. But how it can go to a child in all respects as a holistic approach with the tips on lenses and how, make this, how to make this child to select a, uh, a frame, that is more important. More than that, all of you would have been uh, seen, these children uh, would have been less compliant to our uh, uh, the prescribed spectacles. So how to make them compliant to it? That is the motive should be there behind us, rather than just giving the numbers and then asking them to go. So what is the goal? All of us have a goal. See, most of us think that by improving the lines of visual acuity, that is the end of the uh, prescription, prescribing spectacles. But that is not the uh, end. Just by giving numbers alone is not enough. We should also should not ignore the following facts when they have uh, symptoms due to actinopia or any symptom of uh, sebismus could be intermittent or any sight of a glare, photophobia, when a child comes with uh, albinism or rod cone dystrophies or cone rod dystrophies. So we should be aware what is the associated symptom and how do we address the same along with the numbers what uh, we are uh, prescribing. So we first coming to the number, even before deciding the number, the basic requirement is all of us know that cycloplegic refraction is a must. At least for the first visit, a child when he's coming uh, before the age of 12, 15 years, we prefer to do at least one time a cycloplegic refraction. And the revisits decision is on the individual basis. And the refraction, and now all of you are uh, prefer auto refractometry, well and good. But even then, the stick is good in verifying both comparison because some children are non-verbal. So comparing these two will give a better idea for you to get a value what exactly it you need to prescribe. And this is what the drugs, what we practice in our uh, 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 system uh, in Aravind Eye Care. So how, to, how does it? Refraction, most of the time, may must have been done by somebody else or optometrist or refractionist, whoever is helping you. But when you check, what are the things that you should be able, you should be checking it? there should be a good correlation between the retinoscopy values and the subjective values what you have got. And there should be a good correlation between 
uncorrected visual acuity and the amount of error you are giving. So it is 636 person accepting minus 1.5 is perfectly all right. But a 636 uncorrected accepting 3 is something unusual. So that just give a uh, red bulb in our mind that to think about redoing the refraction. And if there is any symptoms of asthenopia, whether the fogging method has been done during retinoscopy. And cylinder axis, whether it has been correlate, correlating well with the K reading through whatever means that you want it. In anisometropia, what is our uh, goal? Are we giving a good binocularity or are we giving good uh, uh, individual good visual acuity? That should be done by binocular assessment. And in general, a higher amotropic or astigmatic or eye with an astigmatism at off axis should be the eye with reduced vision. Sometimes you do, you do see opposite. That depends upon how the subjective has been done, how the refraction has been done. If that is the deviation that what you see, it is better to ask for a, a re-refraction. And then what should be on the follow-up visits? Follow-up visit compliance could be totally different from a first visit. So elicit the present problem. If there is any uh, thing on the structure of the frame and the lens, you just clarify it. And then when you, after doing a refraction, if there's a jump in power, and then assess like what we did in the first time, the uncorrected vision or corrected vision with the spectacles, all the things. And if needed, if there's a more jump in the power, especially in myopia, accommodation and axial length measurement should be done because there is lot of things going on for of the myopia management. And the change in the axis, usually you refine from giving a different axis uh, power unless until you confirm with your uh, K reading. And anisometropia is again repeat your binocular visual function and if it is necessary, a binocular balancing. And now exactly how it is the decision of the umbers. This should be based on the age and the point that myopic shift is going on for three diopter shift is going on per millimeter of axial length, uh, especially in the first three years of life. And that goes on till six years of life for a little bit moderate phase. But after that, even it occurs up to teens in a slow pace. But in depending upon that, you give the correction to enhance the process of immetropization. So basically, a partial correction when there is a long, uh, before below the age of six years, especially three below the age of three years, and then full correction depending upon the subjective and compliance, I mean, uh, co complaints from the uh, patient, uh, you give a full correction. That is the uh, practical point that we follow it. Not moving? Oh yes. So this is the guidelines given by AAO, any uh, uh, book you can find it. But these are only, you can take it as only guidelines. You have to individualize the patient. And if there are any risk factors you think there are present for amblyopia, even a small refractive error should be uh, corrected. And a moderate hypermetropia, usually we wait at least for one more visit to see before correcting because if you give correction in the early age, no other symptoms, a moderate hypermetropia, it's possible that child will retain the power and the early presbyopia will get settled in. So a right prescription, what should be there? Along with your numbers, there should be the line, what exactly the lens or the frame you suggest for that particular person. That means what I feel is a, a holistic approach in prescribing spectacles. So what are the right, uh, way of right lens that you will suggest for these uh, children? As their anatomy is different, they are going to fall, I mean, have get it injured. So now the lenses you have to select depending upon that. Uh, recent, the many things are available, but recently the polycarbonate lenses have been in the market and it's not very expensive, you can give it. And this should be light and thin. If it is heavy, no but child will uh, like it. And naturally, it's, it has to be uh, break free and impact resistant and uh, almost UV protection. So what is it in myopia lenses? In practice, standard lenses, what we, this basic aspect of lenses, I think we all ophthalmologists should know. That CR39 is the basic lens which is available in the market. So this lens is quite cheaper. 
but the lens is thicker. So when you are dealing with the low economic group children, or when you are more of most of the seniors are there, engage with the screening for school children and giving free spectacles. This is the best lens that you can give uh, for free. But when there is a weight and thickness is a question, then you go for other lenses. There are uh, available lenses, PMMA lenses, polycarbonate, MRI, and uh, Trivex. All these lenses are available, but a little bit costlier than the uh, standard lenses. And what about these high index lenses? Do we always, do we suggest them at least uh, this is available? So once they go to the optical shop, if they explain, uh, people have a scientifically, they will have a, uh, I mean, a negative aspect, maybe these people are pushing it for a uh, business. So scientifically, if you feel this child is, will act good with this, then you just recommend them, you just have this high index lenses, especially when the myopia power is my more than four, and especially more than minus six, this definitely helps by reducing the thickness by 50%. Uh, and what are the frames? Small uh, errors, up to four or five errors, it's okay. You can, they can get, the children are very well oriented to the fashion now, so there are many, many frames available, they can go for it. But uh, for higher powers, you, you, you have to recommend saying that it's the, the frame should be thick and uh, full uh, frame because the edges are quite thick. Otherwise, it will cosmetically look very uh, bad for the uh, child. So what is it follow-up? We all know, I think there is going to be a session Next session, what exactly that you have to follow up myopia. But in general, if there is increase of more than 0.5 diopters uh, increase in a year, then you have to think twice and then do the investigations and then think about what to prescribe. And in general, we believe in doing a cover test and binocular function, including accommodation amplitude measurements. And then if there is accommodation lag is there, we consider a uh, fall lenses. If the patients are orthophoric with normal or very low accommodation lag, and then we suggest them uh, defocus lenses. I think the details you will uh, have it in the next session. Coming to the hyperopias, again, hyperopias you have, we have seen, it's very common. And uh, uh, when asymptomatic, you, uh, uh, you, you don't have to train a moderate degree of hypermetropia. It's only the amount what is really needed to achieve that you have to give. That is why we, ta we talk about a partial correction in these uh, conditions. And also in terms of exo deviations, you think device be twice before giving uh, full correction. But when you have an esotropia due to accommodation problem, there is no compromise. When, because you are going to have advantage of developing binocularity and then good alignment. So you could prescribe a full correction. This is the basic indication what you have. And uh, when you give a bifocal, when to give it bifocal in general for any practicing person is whenever there is a difference of deviation from distance and near in accommodative isotropias. When more than near deviation is more than the distance and need extra power, then you give the uh, spectacles for near correction, but make sure what exactly the lens you want and what exactly the segment between upper and lower segment you want. This is what the requirement that you have to give. So this shows this child has got isotropia. With the glasses, yes, some amount is corrected, but still it's not fully corrected. It's uh, near segment is there, but it's not a proper way of wearing the spectacles. Supposing, see, child looks through the uh, uh, lower part, it's good. So the frame should be, it's not snugly fit on the nose. So it should be straight like this, and then fitting snugly on the nose pad, and then in, if possible, if it is not happening, you have to uh, ask them to have a nose pad to support it. And these are all the small, small tips. If you give them, their compliance will automatically will increase, and they will come to you. Uh, they will be there throughout their uh, growing age group. So what is the follow-up? Depending upon, usually, as we said, myopic shift is going to be there. These children also will go for myopic shift. So check them every six months, reduce the power by minus 0.5 steps or 0.75, whatever you uh, feel like. First do it for, if there is bifocal, do it for near, and then go for a distance. If it is uh, a distance alone, go in steps. Usually if the accommodative isotropias, they retain the power for distance. And near, sometimes uh, they uh, get rid of it. 
in that case, if they really want it for continuation, you can suggest even a contact lenses. Coming to the astigmatism, most babies and infants will exhibit astigmatism, some amount of astigmatism, at least a little bit more than minus one diopters, and it usually gets resolved, like our epicanthal folds, usually it gets resolved by the age of uh, three years. But if that is going to be in oblique axis as you uh, do your auto K or K reading, then you should think about giving prescription even uh, that age group. And uh, after three years, I think to certain amount of subjective should be possible, then try to give a full correction. And follow up also here, one uh, important thing here is, now more and more children as they are growing, they are also having allergic conjunctivitis and uh, uh, keratoconus is being on increase, uh, increasing occurrence. So you have to be very careful, you check the axis. If you feel there is a change in the axis, that uh, should give a uh, cautious in your mind and try to do op scan and then uh, see the irregularities on the uh, cornea before you prescribing changing the glasses. And coming to anisometropias, we all know anisocornia is a problem which causes uh, this uh, 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 thing, a 2% for uh, increase in the size of the images for one diopters. So that is what we say up to 5% a child can tolerate. But children, when infants, we are, I have seen even minus 10 or plus 10 even affects uh, if the eyes uh, is not microphthalmic, normally developed eye, they accept very well if you give them at the age of three or four months. But later on, they may not be. But very young children, they accept even anisometropias of large thing. So that should be, if there is more than four diopters, you should think about uh, uh, checking for the fusion. If there is a fusion, it's a small exophoria and eccentric fixation, you just give only a single vision glasses, perfectly all right. You don't have to think about anisoconia there. If there is more than that, then you have to do a binocular balancing. What we mean is, you just reduce the power in the hypermetropic eye and then check for the vision, the maximum vision with no double vision, that is the binocular balancing, you give it. But if the child or the parent wants, no, no, we want a full correction vision for that, then alternative is only a, a contact lenses. So a fake is again one more, Anil Kumar, I think you will remember this. We have been talking about this even quite earlier, about this uh, aspheric lenses. Because the children, when we give a fake yes, no, you, the thick lenses are so thick, they have uh, very heavy and then it falls down because it shows plus 20. And then we found that it is aspheric lenticles are found to be very useful because it's going to be only transient now. After some time, we are going to have any of secondary Im implants. So only for uh, age of one year or one and a half years. So this is what will they will wear very comfortably. And then give only distant correction like this for uh, the actual refractive error. And then near vision add uh, as uh, 18 months because it is the time they use their eyes for a uh, year. And what about the frames now? Again, the frame should fit like this. What exactly it put on the nose also fit on the uh, earlobe. And that should be the frame that you should select. Sometimes you now the patients will come to you, Madam, I can, can, I, uh, uh, can my child wear this frame? So you should be able to give some idea to the parent about whether that can be worn or not. In pseudophakias, I think I don't have to say anything about it. So clear uh, pseudophakia, initially what we practice is at least uh, uh, three to six months time till the, uh, some amount of astigmatism you do see in children rather than in adults. So you just wait for that resolving completely because lenses are going to be expensive before prescribing, uh, suggesting a uh, progressive lenses. And uh, glaucoma, what do we do on the children? Invariably, I think you should have uh, some educate the glaucoma uh, surgeons who are is, uh, uh, treating that look for whenever there is an enlarged eyeball, enlarged cornea, look for the presence of myopia. So they will treat the eye completely and then they would, not, they would have ignored the myopia occurrence and then child will have uh, low vision. So when we give glasses, they will perform well. So make sure that is being done routinely as they come for a glaucoma follow-up, then either refraction should have been or axial length measurement should be done clearly and avoid giving prescriptions when there is very active and edema or corneal scar, unhealed corneal scar. Just wait for some time to get better and then give a prescription. 
So when the children come with albinism or uh, aniridias and those who want tint, what exactly to be done? The tint prescribing should not be universal. So earlier when we say, say just give, go for gray tint, it's a common way of prescribing tint. But this gray, the tint, different tint sometimes, you know, will alter the color perception of these uh, children. So you have to be careful when you uh, prescribe it unless uh, you should give a trial okay. to Just check. Please. See, Albino, what we expect, no? Either she will accept either a blue or Just black or gray uh, screen. So, but this child is feeling better with the uh, 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 yellow lens. So that the is the difference. Uh, All things are available in the market with complete UV protection, but they should be given a trial this before you uh, prescribe okay. this lens. Uh, this is all of you know polycarbonate even now regular lenses are uh, being made in polycarbonate so that is not a uh, 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 big uh, problem so you know whom to all uh, suggest uh, lens coming to important section let's conclude with this compliance to spectacles how do we increase the compliance in these children we have done a large study uh, about four lakh children and we have found the compliance is 40 45 percent not it is not the patients who come to us is a patient in the community. But even for them, how do we increase their compliance? So few hints on that. So myopia, you just give adequate power with a maximum clarity. Don't give more power as you see in your retinoscopy value. Do not overcorrect hyperops. And do not prescribe a large cylinder for any patient who has not worn cylindrical correction earlier. Maybe go with the little bit half amount and then check the next time and then give full correction. If you give full correction first time, definitely they are not going to listen to you. And uh, asthenopic symptoms, you have to address it. Don't ignore addressing the asthenopic symptoms. And then with the adequate counseling about the safety, about other things. And in the follow-up steps, in again, if what is the problem, they are not compliant or whether they are compliant get it and then try to solve those problems. And if there is a minor change in the power, unless there are scratches or any other indication to change, don't change it because they're not going to be satisfied by giving a 0.25 increase in the uh, power. And then psycho refraction, whenever it's needed, it's a big change or anything, you should not hesitate to do a cyclo refraction. If there's a change in the power, just with give a, don't give a prescription, Discuss with the parents this about the problem and about the uh, other uh, factors which is causing it before giving the prescription. And uh, uh, my axis, uh, astigmatism, pseudo effects accept the astigmatism very, tolerate it very well. But uh, these children, when you change the axis, you have to be uh, very, very careful in changing the axis when they come to you. So ideally, the spectacle should be like this. So well uh, centered frame and centering uh, width uh, frame should be wide enough so that there is just a light, slight clearance between the frame temples. Usually we say, no, you, you should be able to pass your finger like this. Then that is perfect. If you this, you should, uh, it, this should be here exactly like this. And this should be on the ear. So these three points, what we say, uh, these three points, if you know, and then to know how do we check the frame correct, that four touch points, if there is a frame, uh, whether the, all the four things are touching on the thing, I don't have the slide there. Then it is uh, perfectly all right. So it's, it's a combined science with art. I think we have to, if you develop this, you will enjoy. You don't feel like that I am seeing almost only the artifactural patients, but each child is going to be different. You will definitely enjoy these children giving prescriptions if you uh, really combine your uh, science with your art. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive view about how we can prescribe spectacles to children and the need of our understanding the very basics that are there. It's, it's essential. Uh, just doing surgery or just doing a refraction is not adequate in them. It's very, very important to see them and, as you mentioned, follow them up for compliance. We'll, we'll go on to the next talk, which is by Dr. Vinita Gupta on Amblyopia Mythbusters and Evidence Base. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, some myths which are there with amblyopia, which obviously with the uh, PEDIC group, uh, large studies on ATS, 
those myths have been removed and you know we have lots of new treatment modalities which are coming up for MLIPIA, which are actually not like conventional treatments. So as we all know, MLIPIA is maybe a unilateral or a bilateral decrease in vision resulting from an abnormal visual input or an abnormal uh, development of neurons uh, occurring usually till seven to 10 years of age. But now with the concept of uh, plasticity of the visual system, there are lots of more therapies which have come up for management of MLIPIA. We all know the usual causes, the deprivation, the strabismus, and the refractive causes. Uh, but earlier, MLIPIA was being considered a dogma. Only early diagnosis will help. Full-time patching was thought to be imperative. And it was thought that treatment beyond nine of years is a dead, dead cause. But now, uh, with the PEDIC group, which, was, which has undertaken these MLIPIA treatment studies over 100 different centers, we, and I've published these 18 uh, studies. Some of these myths I'll be talking about which have been removed by these studies. The most, earlier it was thought that only um, uh, patching is the gold standard of treatment and full-time patching is imperative, but what is the fact? Uh, we all know that patching is definitely an effective treatment. Better in poor school children, has a faster recovery and a shorter duration of treatment, but remember, younger the child, the risk of occlusion in the is also more, and besides the stigma of wearing a patch, besides the wear, uh, problem of irritation which may occur with s in some children with the skin allergies and all, the major paradigm shift which has come up of the full-time patching is a part-time patching. It works as well as full-time patching. And this is what the ATS study 2A and 2B have told. For moderate amblyops, two hours of patching was found to be almost equivalent to six hours of patching. Although the group of six hours of patching had a faster improvement, but the end result was the same. For severe amblyopia, at the end of treatment period, a full-time patching compared to a six hours of patching was almost found to be equivalent. And always remember, higher the hours of patching, poor will be compliance. And compliance is a big issue, as we all know, with patching. So obviously, having six hours of patching for severe amblyopia works equally well, because these patients usually have a very, very poor vision. They may not be able to do their daily needs if they are given a full-time patching. Second paradigm shift is actual patch is not necessary. As I said, patching is not the only treatment we have, so we can replace it with atropine penalization. So the ATS study one found that atropine for penalization is as effective as patching. And although, again, the occlusion group had a faster improvement or a quicker improvement, then the second thing which the ATS said was a daily atropine versus atropine once a week again had similar results, except that obviously the better compliance was there if you give weekly atropine and improvement was almost equivalent. Then the second myth is amblyopia cannot be treated after a certain age, as I said, because, but now we know that this brain is neuroplastic. So it is not that it is, uh, we are at a dead end. So we can work beyond the critical period, which was thought to be a critical period till a particular age of seven to nine years, but now that limit is not there. So successful treatment of amblyopia is possible outside the critical period. It has been seen uh, by the ATS three studies, different groups in that, that optical correction alone improves uh, about one fourth of the patients who are beyond seven years of age. Prescribing two to six hours of patching with near activities and atropine further helps in improvement, especially even if they have been treated earlier with patching alone or have not been treated at all. And for patients, again, above 12 years of age, even if they have not been previously treated, just doing patching with near activities will help improve their visual acuity. So patching is effective in older children. So it is not that patching is not effective in older children. Every child, every older adolescent, and even an adult should be given a trial of patching or an amblyopia therapy, I would say. So window of opportunity is no longer limited to that period of seven to nine years. You can treat even in adulthood, early adulthood and adolescent age. Second thing is treatment of amblyopia is most effective with children. Obviously, as I said, it is more effective younger the child, uh, the younger the child is. So it is more effective in children who are less than seven years of age, but children beyond 13 years of age also have shown improvement. Although the response to treatment may be slower, may be requiring a higher duration or time of patching, and the extent of recovery may be less complete. It may not be totally complete, as this was found in the ATS3 studies. Then the next myth is glasses alone may not help. So how well do glasses alone treatment treat amblyopia? This is another myth which is there. As I said, optical correction alone will help in treating one third of the patients and help in the improvement of the visual acuity, constant use of glasses in these patients whether it is anisometropic, whether it is strabismic or it makes them like it works in all cases. And 
it is the ATS-5 and ATS-7 and ATS-13. All the studies were on based on, uh, were doing on based on the refractive correction for different uh, types of MLI IPRs. And they found even for higher refractive errors, those with anisometropic MLIs, those with strabismic MLIs, or those with mixed MLIs, all of them they did get have some improvement with just refractive corrections. The effect of optical vision, although, would decrease with increasing density. So if the severity of MLI is more, it may not work as well as for a milder or moderate MLI IPS and with the advancing age of the child. And then the next is near activities are important for patching efficacy. So do, a, do the near activities actually enhance the efficacy of patching? So it was the ATS 6 which found, yeah, yes, that patching with near work does improve uh, visual acuity faster if it is done uh, along with patching, if the near work is given at the time of patching, rather than people who are not doing any near work at the time when they are having the patching being done for the eye. So next tip, myth is once the vision stops improving, should we stop the treatment? So the next is very, very high rates of recurrence have been seen if the MLIP treatment is just suddenly stopped. So it is important that you should not just stop it like that once you have achieved a certain particular visual acuity or you have reached a uh, uh, plateau. It is very important to continue for at least five to in my practice, I usually continue for almost three months after my initial thing before I stop the treatment, any treat any form of treatment for the resolution of MLIPR. Second is greater recurrences have been seen with the greater, if the visual activity at the end of treatment and a greater number of lines of improvement have been there or if there's a previous history of recurrence. So in all these cases, you may have to customize your treatment and the customize your treatment even after achieving a good visual acuity or a visual acuity of six 20 by 20 or 6 by 6 at the end of the period. So the uh, patient is not cured once he has achieved a visual acuity of 20 by 20. It doesn't mean the embliopic eye is seeing almost exactly like a non-embliopic eye, fellow eye. So should we stop the therapy? No, because we know embliopia is not a monocular disease. This is a new thing which has come a major paradigm shift. Patching alone is not enough. We need to work on the vision therapy systems. So the new therapies which are, this is I'm just shifting, you know, the new therapies which have come up with the behavioral treatments, the perceptual learning, which is basically the tachoptic therapy using virtual reality games or using uh, video games, using VTS systems, and along with pharmacotherapies. Pharmacotherapies are still under trial, and the role of uh, your art, uh, high frequency uh, transcranial aluminum stimulations, which is again under trials. Uh, the only thing which I talk about is the dichoptic therapy, which has actually taken up a f uh, uh, lead over the patching treatments, especially for mild to moderate embryops. I have stopped using uh, patching for mild to moderate embryops. You can directly start with uh, dichoptic therapies in these patients, and they usually work very well for these patients. You have anagraphic glasses, red green glasses to be used. We have puzzle games available both for the iPads, which is a Tetris, for the Apple groups, and for the uh, Samsung, or for the uh, other uh, thing we have other games as a well, lazy eye groups. And then we have this video virtual reality systems, which are there, again, based on the dichoptic systems, which are can be paired with the shutter glasses to enhance the effect of the patching as well as uh, the dichoptic therapy at the same time. So just to conclude, I would say that we know that early identification and intervention in the critical age group would definitely need to better results, better recovery, and restoration of not only the visual acuity, which is not just our purpose. Our purpose is to restore the binocularity of the child. but Never say it's too late to any child or any parent who's coming even at an adolescent or a per person who's coming in his college days and early adulthood. Every eye, lazy eye deserves treatment. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Vinita, for uh, detailing all the things. As she said rightly, you customize that management. It is very important. And now you should all be available about the software therapy, whatever is available in the market, and which is the bone. See, there are many... Uh, uh, dealers coming that this is good, that is good. But you should be able to judge which is going to be good for that particular. You should not waste your time on uh, checking it. So that uh, should be selection. And one more thing, this customization also should be kept up on the age and then capability or cooperation of the patient. Yeah, and the uh, amount of visual loss. Supposing the child has got 1 by 60 vision in one eye, uh, 660 vision in one eye, other eye is uh, thing, and the child is uh, infant or uh, toddler, definitely that child will cooperate very nicely for our patching. <laughs> or will not cooperate, but with the, our thing, we can make them do it. But little bit older age group, the same thing you are finding, two year, three year old, will never comply for it. So then think about what exactly to be done. So it is not only the thing, but you should also think about the age and then the extent of the visual loss and then the available modes and the background education of the parents and the patient, and then you select your uh, thing, definitely all of us will be uh, uh, successful in managing only the correct thing.
Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your input. Uh, we'll now request Dr. Shilpi Nanavare for her talk on recent trends in management of ROP. Good afternoon, everyone. So we all know that ROP is increasing nowadays because of better NIC facilities, and it is a preventable cause of blindness in the children if timely intervened. So in the last few years, the treatment is, has been shifted from cryotherapy to the lasers, anti vegfs and now vitrectomies. So why there is a shift? It is because of the ICROP third edition, which is recently uh, added in 2021. With the advent of the improved imaging techniques and technologies, and specifically because of the paradigm shift from the laser therapy to the anti vegf therapies, and one most important thing is medical legal aspects. First, the classification was given in 1984 and then revised in 1987. Further revision was done in 2005, where free plus and APROP was added in the classification. And the recent one is in 2021. It is done because to recognize the other patterns of the ROP, which is not seen in all regions of the world, and because of the innovations in the ophthalmic imaging and introduction of the anti vegf therapies. So what are the diagnostic modalities? Direct ophthalmoscopy is not advisable in cases of ROP, as it only detects either the zone 1 disease or when the baby uh, presence in the advanced stage of stage 4 or 5. Indirect ophthalmoscopy is still the gold standard, but the limitation is that you need to, you need to do a scleral depression, which can cause sometimes the problems in the baby. Wide field imaging in the form of the red cam or the Indian version that is neo-red is coming up because of, because it can, you can document the disease and especially for the medical legal cases. It is not a uh, model which is led by the ophthalmologist. In this, the, uh, nurses are trained, and we can send the images to the ophthalmologist, and from the far areas, the babies can only be asked to reach the tertiary centers only if they are needing the treatment. So it is based on the objective versus the subjective interpretation. And yes, now we are seeing the surges in the medical legal aspects and the gross negligence and the compensations are in crores. Another, is, another one in the recent future will be the artificial intelligence. Now coming to the treatment options, cryotherapy, it is mostly outdated now because of the unfavorable results and many complications related to this treatment modality. So, well, then come the red lasers, which was a uh, I'll say ki it was a treatment which came after uh, cryotherapy in the ROP cases, which was done in only in the threshold ROP cases. After that come the green laser, which was introduced to the world by the PGI group of the India. So with this, there came the newer indications for the laser because ETROP came because there were the unfavorable results seen in the 20% of the babies when we treat them in the threshold cases. But there was an urge that we should treat the patients in the pre-threshold stage so that the favorable outcomes should be increased. So with the ETROP, the favorable outcomes increased to eight, uh, around 87% and the visual equity was achieved in more than 20 by 40 in more than 80% of the babies. So these are the various types of type 1 ET ETROP where the lasers are advisable in the pre-threshold stage also. While in the case of the type 2 ETROP, you can just follow up the babies. Another disease is the rush disease or what we call is APROP, which ha still has an unfavorable outcome in more than 25% of the babies. Half zone diseases, when the vessels are not mature even beyond the macula, you can treat this disease in two strategies. One is two-step laser that you have to do the laser in the first setting up to the presumed arcades, three discs diopter away from the macula, and subsequently you can laser the retina when uh, once it matures outside the macula. Or you can use anti wedges then followed by the laser. Another uh, is the hybrid ROP, in which there is a combination of the AP ROP and a staged ROP. 
and this also the lasers are indicated aggressively smoldering rop when a uh, few clock hours they doesn't regress and it is usually treated to prevent the complications when the baby have achieved the age of 48 pma or gain the weight of 500 grams additional indications are persistent avascular zones after the anti vegfs or recurrences which are seen now coming to the anti vegfs the first trial was the beat rop trial in which the long term side effects were not addressed similar was the case with the rainbow trial even in that the long term side effects were not addressed the absolute indications are the media haze adjunctive to the lasers pre surgical and in the rescue therapy when a trained ophthalmologist is not present to do the lasers so in present scenario the current indications are aprop zone 1 disease and in cases of half zone disease there we should use the anti vegfs cautiously in cases of relatively advanced cases because of the problems of retinal breaks and the crunch phenomenon advantages yes we all know it has a wow effect and it induces less myopia refractive errors yes as i already said it induces the less myopia but it is seen that more cases of hypermetropia are seen with the use of the anti vegfs so coming to the adverse events the it causes crunch phenomena and the systemic factors coming to neuro development outcomes there are mixed responses with the use of the anti vegf few studies are saying that it causes neuro development delay while others say that there is no neuro development delay with the use of the anti vegfs there are the many options but we are still struggling about the doses which dose is to be used and what are the timing of the injections but it is said that it should only be given in the phase 2 when there is a vegf surge and how much is the time period of the effect of any anti vegf we don't know so now coming to the regression it refers to the disease involution and there are different patterns seen with the spontaneous regression or after the treatment the signs of the regression are seen early with the anti vegf therapy when compared to the laser photocoagulation these are the signs of the regression like you see the decrease in the plus disease or vascularization up to the peripheral vascular uh, retina so with the laser you can see the dilatation of the pupil retraction of the blood vessels decrease in the dilatation and tortuosity of the blood vessels flattening of the ridge and regression of the disease and this figure shows the regression of the disease after the use of the anti vegf reactivation it is more commonly seen after anti vegfs compared to the laser therapy yes it is also seen with the lasers and in that cases you need to just do the fill in lasers in cases of the recurrences while with the anti vegf the recurrence is seen more earlier than with the eccentrics when compared to the avestin so signs of the reactivation are development of the new line will you conclude yes, please yes. thank you so this uh, the most important thing is that you need to document whether there is a regression recurrence or reactivation of the disease so persistent avascular retina is seen more commonly after the anti vegf use the other modalities are the ffa and the oct especially in the era of the anti vegfs use thank you please i should skip this yeah, question actually it's a little long yeah. just one small uh, point i would want to know in zone 2 diseases are you still uh, going ahead with lasers or do you prefer anti vegfs so over lasers so we prefer lasers okay in zone 2 diseases but uh, i think that that is a point that laser used to be a old age old treatment but i think in zone 2 diseases even lasers are working very well even aggressive rops which are in zone 2 especially in anterior zone 2 where you have aggressive rop that's why the terminology is now changed from aggressive yeah so yeah. lasers do work well and patients may not need laser uh, after anti vegf so but we so have seen when most of the cases the uh, there is a thinning of the blood vessels and after a time there uh, there is a recurrence and we need to do the lasers in maximum cases but usually yes, if you follow up the amount of the laser done is less i agree but uh, 10 to 14 weeks you follow then maybe uh, people are even following up till 60 weeks so uh, we should not hurry with laser yes, and we can maybe ffa as you mentioned the machine three netra these new machines which have come up so ffa still has a role so basically i wanted to emphasize that anti vegfs are taking over lasers these days yes, that is what i wanted to okay thank you thank you thank you dr shilpi
Now I would request Dr. Sujeta Pareja Ma'am to discuss about the do's and don'ts in traumatic cataracts in children. Cat traumatic cataract in itself is that different from that of a management of a normal cataract. So traumatic cataract management in children is definitely very challenging. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. And I thank the AOS uh, for giving me opportunity to speak on pediatric traumatic cataract, do's and don'ts. I don't have any financial interest in this presentation. So all traumatic cataracts is more or like a surprise for us. Uh, we don't know how do they present to us. Children, uh, sometimes they come to you saying uh, that they don't know that they had any trauma or not also. So they can present to you with variety of morphological features where they can have associated corneal uh, pathologies as well as posterior segment pathologies. You can see here they can present to you with a total cataract or with a membranous cataract or they can have a dialysis and then when you go about doing a investigations, you can find that there are some other uh, pathologies associated with it. So traumatic cataracts account for 29 to 57% of childhood cataracts, but what is important, the management is very challenging. And we have to take into consideration certain points that age of the child and the risk of alopia in these children and as we know, very small children, when they present to us, there is still an ongoing development going on. And then if we are tackling a uh, cataract uh, in the same sitting, the IOL power calculation, which also is a, a debatable issue and difficult to calculate in children, and then associated corneal and retinal pathologies. Along with that, we should also keep in mind that these eyes are a uh, risk for uh, always having an increased inflammatory response. So preoperative evaluation uh, is very, very, you should be very meticulous in that. If you see this uh, case of a uh, child who is present to, to you, if you dilate it, you can see there is a corneal scar, there is a posterior synechia, there is a total cataract. But what is important, you have to look at the capsule, whether the capsule, there is a, even a small capsular rupture, whether there it's there or not. If it is a frank rupture coming to you very early, well and good, you can very well know and do it. But these are certain things. Sometimes there is a sealed uh, a capsule which will be there. There are fibrotic uh, membrane which is associated. So all these are very important when uh, you are going to manage these cases. So let's start with um, one of these cases. Uh, this is a child who just presented to us. You can see there is a total cataract and there is a corneal, uh, already a sealed corneal uh, tear. And what is happening, you see the fibrotic capsule. So it's very, very difficult. I was trying to do a, a entire capsular excess, but it's still difficult. So we try to do maximum capsular excess. So take the help of your uh, trata forceps, try to do it. And what is happening, we try to do more than 180 degree, but still there was a fibrotic membrane which was there. So what we did, we took the help of uh, our uh, microforceps uh, scissors and then just after doing it, we left two clock hours and then since this child was around four uh, years old, since the PC was intact, we had to do a PPC and give an intraocular lens. Uh, coming to the second case. Uh, mm. Just one minute. It's not playing. Hello. Somebody from the audiovisual, the media Please is not playing. Please, it's not playing. That. So can I just go and do it? Okay. You know, I've told them to do it. So since I cannot show you, this is hyperlinked actually. It was not playing, so they did it, but still it is not playing. So coming to the third case, here in another child who had come to us, and you can see there is a fibrotic uh, capsule in these cases, and there is a total cataract. We could go about to do a complete rexus in these cases, but what I wanted to show you is that look at this fibrotic posterior capsule which is also there. So a uh, lot of wrinklings and all. So even though child was eight years old, we had to tackle the posterior ca capsule and uh, 
try to take out the fibrotic membrane which was there because very important in this children is the vision uh, access clearing is very much needed because anyway you do a good uh, thing and then afterwards the amblyopia sets in. So there are certain uh, protocols or certain things you should be taking into consideration when you are dealing with any traumatic cataracts and especially in children. Uh, better to avoid uh, doing a IUL surgery, what I am saying, not a cataract, it's an IUL surgery during the primary repair. So any case who is coming to you with an open globe injury and you see a very clear cut corneal laceration, better to do the first, in the first sitting, the corneal repair and then you plan for doing a uh, IUL in the second sitting. But if you see that a child is an amblogenic, a two years child, the patient cannot be taken repeatedly under GA and you see the anterior capsule is already uh, ruptured in this cases and the IUL is uh, all the uh, material is out it is better to tackle then and there whether to put a IUL then and there it is again a debatable issue but after you have done a good uh, primary repair wait uh, you can take up the cataract surgery within one week to one month amblogenic age group is very very crucial because very important you have to clear the visual axis so presence of corneal wound decides your timing of surgery or putting in a, a primary intraocular lens, which we all know gives the best result. Posterior segment pathology, any iris damage has to be managed. And very important, once you give the IOL, send the patient, but you have to follow them up because long-term uh, follow-up complications are very important. There can be a rise of intraocular pressure leading to glaucoma. These eyes are anyway inflamed all the time. You have to give them long time steroid dose and posterior capsular opacification should be managed. So my take home message is meticulous examination of each case is individualized. So all childhoods uh, have to be dealt with how they are going to pres uh, presenting to you. Plan for the primary repair first and look for any associated ocular injuries. Planning for IOL uh, implantation is very crucial when you see there is a very a bad uh, corneal wound and you cannot calculate the IOL power, you can take the IOL power of the other eye, but visual rehabilitation and management of complications is a continuous process. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your talk. And since we are running short of time, we'll move to the next talk by Dr. Shreya Shah. She is not there. She is not there. Okay. Yeah. Okay, she'll come in. Okay, so Dr. Mona Lisa will be presenting the talk on evaluation of visual acuity in pediatric patients. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the scientific committee of AIS for giving me this opportunity. So I'll be talking about visual acuity assessment in children. This is a very basic topic. So before beginning, I would like to highlight some normal visual milestones. Soon after the birth, the child blinks at light, fixes and develops by two months of age, accommodation begins by four months of age, Minus reflex uh, is there by five months of age, stereopsis begins by six months of age, and visual differentiation of objects is there by nine months of age. Clinical methods of measuring acuity can be classified into three categories. Detection acuity, resolution acuity, and recognition acuity. Detection acuity is just uh, tells the presence or absence of object. Resolution acuity is the ability to discriminate uh, between two spatially separated targets. Recognition acuity is the ability to recognize progressively smaller optotypes. So we can uh, classify the uh, children into four categories while measuring the visual acuity. Infants, pre-verbal up to three years of age, verbal pre-literate up to five years of age, and verbal literate children. Infants and pre-verbal, they do not uh, communicate much. So there are few signs which can tell you that the child is having poor vision. If the child is staring at bright light, if there is flickering eye movements, uh, eyelid movements are there, in presence of nystagmus, and if the child is uh, poking his eyes, then that gives uh, uh, indication of having poor vision. There are some indirect assessment of vision by uh, blink response is a response to sound. Minus re reflex, it is closer of the eyes on approach of an object. Uh, induced prism atropia test, uh, vertical prisms can be placed uh, in front of the eye to uh, see the fixation pattern. Occlusion of the eye, if one eye vision is poor and other eye vision is good, then the child resists occlusion of the sound eye. 
So in infants and favorable children, vision can be uh, measured uh, by uh, different techniques. Fixation pattern can be checked by CSM method. Uh, C is central. This is the location of the corneal reflex. Uh, S for steady and M is maintained. If uh, the fixation pattern is central, steady, and maintained, then that indicates a uh, visual acuity of 2030 to 2020. Uh, if there is unsteady central fixation, then the child's visual acuity can be less than 2200. In cases of gross eccentric fixation, child's visual ca acuity can be less than counting finger one meter. Resolution acuity can be checked with the help of optokinetic drum, which induces optokinetic nystagmus. It has su succession of black and white stripes. Narrowest width of the strip eliciting the eye movement measures the visual acuity. The grating acuity can be uh, detected by fourth choice preferential looking test. So it uh, uh, based on the principle that the infant attention is more attracted by pattern, stabil uh, pattern stimulus. Stellar acuity card, it has homogeneous surface on one side and black white stripes on the other side. Uh, Keller acuity cards, it based on the same principle as stellar acuity card. Gear gratings can be uh, used to assess the grating uh, acuity. High contrast gratings of various facial frequencies along with a pair of blank uh, paddle is used. Uh, the grating level is printed on each handle and the unit uh, for measurement of visual acuity is cycles per centimeter for of surface. Cardiff acuity, it uh, uh, based on the principle of vanishing optotype. Uh, it has pictures with two dark lines and a white space and the picture blends with gray background at the acuity threshold. It uh, determines the detection acuity and resolution acuity. Visually evoked potential, it is the electroencephalographic recording of the occipital lobe in response to visual stimulus. Plus BEP, it reflects the activity of the central retina and it is a good assessment of macular function. Big candy test in this test, uh, small sweets uh, which are uh, used for cake decoration are uh, uh, given to the child. If the child is able to appreciate this candies, then it uh, indicates that the child's vision is better than 2080. In coin test, several coins of different sizes are shown to the child. It, is, it uh, determines the detection acuity, uh, the visual acuity based on the smallest coin picked by the child. Miniature toy test, it also uh, determines the recognition acuity. Uh, it is done at a distance of three meter. The child is asked to pick matching pair of toy and the smallest toy correctly matched gives the visual acuity. So visual acuity can be determined by this uh, simple formula, 0.3 multiplied by object distance in meter divided by object size in millimeter. Uh, verbal preliterate and verbal literate child, they communicate well. So we can measure the visual acuity in this uh, age group by um, showing them pictures. It determines the recognition acuity. Several pictures like Allen's picture chart, Leah symbol, case symbol, these are used for determining the visual acuity. The child is given a small uh, hand chart showing the similar picture and the child is asked to match the picture. Similarly, the recognition acuity uh, can be determined by letters, uh, by Ito TV chart and Sheridan Gardiner's chart. The principle is same only. The child is given a small handbook uh, uh, where the letters are written and the child matched the letters. Letter, uh, recognition acuity can also be determined by landlord C and E test. The child is asked to tell the direction of C and E. And when the child is a grown up child, then visual acuity can be tested by using Snellen's chart or Logmark acuity chart. Near vision can be tested by using this uh, symbol uh, chart. So things to remember uh, when uh, we uh, check a child, when we check the visual acuity of a child, the environment should be child friendly. And always uh, uh, make the child, small child, seated on parents' lap. Always try to gain the child's attention by singing uh, a rhyme or whistling. And you can encourage the child uh, do, uh, while doing the examination by uh, applauding or by giving chocolate. That will definitely help in examining the child. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Mona Lisa, for your talk. Ma'am, I have one small question from you. Like, uh, how important is to have all these investigation modalities in our clinics? Because in busy OPDs, in these pre-verbal children, we may skip taking visual acuities and just proceed with uh, fixation behavior. That yes. is all we usually yes. do. Simple. We, we, get, we have to make it simple because these children will not cooperate for prolonged test, uh, different test. As simple as I say, in infant, this uh, uh, CSM, and your alternate eye patching will definitely will give you some uh, idea about it. And then teller acuity, where the important comes there as a uh, acuity uh, in uh, people where you are going to treat your amblyopia. So in that case, you can use the Lea paddle is much better. Teller acuity in a bit, little bit uh, older children can be used. But Lea uh, uh, paddle is seems to be much better. And matching card. Simple matching card. Even need not be even HOTV. HOTV need a box and illumination, and it's not easily available. The Sheridan Gardner other charts or Cambridge charts are easily available. And those charts can be used even girls, two years old girls are able to do it. When it comes to boys, it's two and a half year old boy. He's able to match the letters. We have seen in experience. So from that age group onwards, you can start using it. Only thing is, you need to mention what method that you have checked in that first visit. And then equal your logmar acuity or whatever acuity. So that that can be compared when you come next time. If you don't if you don't mention the type of the test what you have done, then it's very difficult to assess the improvement in visit. Mainly what we want, we want to detect amblyopia and then we want to treat amblyopia. These are two things very important. So in that case, if you mention it, the test and then what is exactly Make it very simple. VEP and all, it's uh, uh, nothing. We don't have to think about it at all. It is not going to tell us. It is going to tell us child is seeing or not. It is not going to tell us what exactly the other uh, uh, amount is. And it is not essential also. And uh, what we use, sagmestrum, all those things, need not be complicated at all. Go with a similar test. Definitely, with your time, you will be able to detect problem. Thank you very much, ma'am. So we will invite Thanks. our next speaker, Dr. Vishali for her talk on myopia management in clinical practice. Uh, I'm going to just give a bird's eye view of myopia in clinical practice. So why is myopia control a concern? It is almost undeniable to say that the myopia, in this myopia a, a pandemic, almost 50% of the population is going to be in myop in a few years. In this 15% are going to transition into high myopia. And as we know, as the grade of the myopia increases, the myopia related complications like cataract, glaucoma, retinal detachment, the myopic maculopathy also increase. So does the child need treatment for myopic progression? So we have to consider the age at which there is onset of myopia. If the parents are myopia, uh, the parents have myopia. If there's excess of near work, if there is reduced outdoor time, and the amount of hyperopia for age, if it is less, then there is a risk of onset and progression of myopia. Coming to the examination of a myope, the history taking is of a prime importance. We have to consider the age of onset of myopia, parental history of myopia, if there is any myopic progression, and as the outdoor time and the near work habits also have to be documented. We also have to take a best corrected visual acuity following a cycloplegic refraction. We also have to assess the elements of accommodation and virgins, a good slit lamp examination and fundus examination, corneal topography when we consider the to contact lens fitting, and also uh, axial lens measurement. We should always adopt a comprehensive management when it comes to myopia. Uh, children, generally, we have to try to prevent the onset of myopia. If they are already myopes, we prevent them from becoming high myopes. If they are already high myopes, we want to prevent them to have all these myopia-related comorbidities. So how do we prevent the onset of myopia? We have to encourage outdoor activities for at least two hours per day to keep myopia at bay. So this exposure to high intensity light stimulates the release of retinal dopamine, which uh, has an effect on the circadian rhythm, which uh, determines the ocular growth. It also stimulates the release of vitamin D, which also has a protective effect on the myopia. And also the accommodative demand in an outdoor environment is less. The other most important thing, apart from curbing the excessive near work, is to limit the screen time. Children below two years of age, strictly no screen time. And children more than five years of age, not more than two hours of screen time should be given. 
the other myopia control strategies would include the spectacles, contact lenses and atropine eye drops. So the question is when to start and what to start. Documented myopic progression and if there is high risk of progression, you start on these myopia control moda modalities and what to start whatever is available or affordable for the patient, the child's preference and the parent's preference, and obviously the associated ocular conditions like presence of accommodation lag, near esophoria, or ocular surface disorders has to be considered. How do we guard success of these treatment modalities? We have to look for any positive and meaningful impact on refraction and axial length, and most importantly, there should be no rebound on cessation. The peripheral rays are supposed to have more potency on you know, altering the ocular growth, so you can see this peripheral hyperopic defocus acts as a stimulus for increase in axial length, whereas the myopic defocus has an opposite effect. So these two are the important things that we are exploiting while we use the optical modalities for myopia control. So by reducing hyperopic defocus and incorporating myopic defocus and simultaneously correcting the vision, we are able to control myopia. Spectacles, the advantage that it has is that it is easy to fit, it is affordable, well accepted and minimally invasive. Initial days, the prominent factors was to undercorrect, but then later it was found that it actually worsens myopia. Then came the bifocal spectacles and the progressive addition spectacles, which was found to work only in a specific subset of uh, population like those with accommodative lag or uh, near esophoria. The recent uh, trend is the introduction of the defocus incorporated multiple segments where you have a central clear zone for distance correction surrounded by small lenslet which induce the myopic defocus. They seem to have a good efficacy in controlling both the spherical equivalent and the axial elongation. Similarly, in contact lenses, you can see two annular zones here. The dark colored annular zones are those which induce the myopic defocus and the light colored zones are the ones which are correcting your myopia. So you have both correction and treatment of myopia progression. So what are the pros and cons of having contact lenses? There is always going to be the risk of infection, the cost involved, and also limitation in correcting your astigmatism. The efficacy is as good as that of the defocus incorporated multifocal segments. The next uh, uh, modality is the orthokeratology. So these are rigid gas permeable lenses which are worn overnight. And as the child wears the uh, lenses, you can see that there's a central flattening of the cornea. And following lens removal, the flattening or the reshapen cornea persists. So this advantage would be that the child can be correction free during the day, but also the disadvantage would be, again, the consideration for infection, also the rebound on discontinuation. And also we need to do a corneal topography before we consider the patient for a orthokeratology lens. The last would be the pharmacological treatment. Uh, the low dose atropine is what we use as a pharmacological therapy. The principle is that it uh, uh, has a role in you know, scleral remodeling and also it modulates the release of the dopamine which has an effect in the ocular growth. Uh, we have to consider the side effects while prescribing the atropine. You can have redness, you can have diminished near vision, you can have flushing. And the most important of all is that it has a dose-dependent inhibitory effect. So if it is a lower dose atropine like 0 0.01 to 0 0.1, the efficacy is slightly on the lesser side. On the higher dose, if we go, the efficacy is better. Apart from this dose-related efficacy, we must also remember the side effects also increase with dosage and the rebound also is greater with higher dose and younger children. And poorer response is noted in children less than 8 years of age if the child is a high myope and has a high family history of myopia. So just a bird's eye view of the myopia control strategies. The single vision lenses and the single vision contact lenses that we use corrects the myopia but it has no role in controlling the myopia progression. Atropine and the behavioral modification has only efficacy in controlling the myopia and does not con uh, correct the myopia per se. The optical modalities like the glasses, the bifocals, progressive addition, and DIMS, the orthokeratology and multifocal contact lenses, they both correct the myopia as well as control the myopic progression. So while considering optical modalities, you can go for a defocus incorporated multiple segments or you can go for a multifocal contact lens. Atropine, you can go for 0.01 or if 0.05 will soon be available in market after studies, you can consider that as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vishali. We'll invite our next speaker.
Dr. Srikant for the talk on controlling myopia progression, the next step forward. There'll be slight overlap between my talk and the previous talk. So could we have the uh, slide, please? Yeah. So just uh, as we have finally got over the COVID pandemic, there's another epidemic silently brewing in the East, and that is the epidemic of myopia. The world has seen an exponential growth of myopia. It is estimated that almost 50% of the world population would be affected by 2050, and more than 10% are likely to be high myopia. Against this backdrop, I'll be presenting my talk, Controlling Myopia Progression, The Next Step Forward. We all know that myopia increases slowly till about eight to 10 years of age. After that, matching with the pubertal spurt, it increases almost linearly and rapidly till about 18 to 20 years of age and finally stabilizing there. And what do we offer as ophthalmologists? We, as the myopia keeps increasing, we just keep changing the spectacles and contact lenses, pacifying the patient that it's going to stabilize at around 20 years of age and then we'll perform refractive surgery. It is as if we are allowing the fire to spread before trying to douse the fire. It's high time that we think differently. So if we have to control myopia, we have to act on the rising phase of myopia. Myopia provides us with a big window of opportunity to act. We just have to find some ways and means to control myopia in these years. So to control myopia, we need to understand as to why myopia increases. The most potent stimulus for progression of myopia is a peripheral hyperopic defocus. As a result, the eyeball tends to increase in size to bring this image onto the focus, onto the retina. It can be compared to phototropism as seen in plants, where plants tend to grow towards the source of light. So we can control myopia by making the sclera strong and preventing lobe expansion, or by simply converting this peripheral hyperopic defocus into a myopic defocus, removing the stimulus for progression of myopia. Based on these concepts, there are various myopia treatment modalities are present. But before going into them, I'll touch upon the techniques under investigation. 2% pyrenzepine gel is a selective M1 receptor antagonist. It has all the beneficial effects of atropine and myopia without any of its side effects. Scleral collagen cross-linking aims at making the sclera strong and prevent globe expansion. There's an increasing role of certain biomolecules like dopamine, 7-methylxanthine, and melatonin in myopia. Dopamine has been shown to have a protective effect in myopia. 7-methylxanthine strengthens the sclera and melatonin has been found to be raised in myopia and has to do something with circadian rhythm. An increasing role of RPE has been seen in releasing growth factors which control the scleral modeling. So in near future, we may, we may be seeing some newer modalities of treatment emerging out of this current research. Coming to the modalities in vogue, increased outdoor activities has been shown to reduce the onset of myopia and has minimal effect in reducing the progression of myopia. Pinhole glasses are being used by some, but it has got no effect in control of myopia. Progressive addition lenses and bifocal lenses have only a minimal role and is not a viable option for clinical application. Stellis glasses utilize concentric rings of highly aspherical lens slits. These create a myopic defocus similar to orthokeratology. In initial studies, they have shown promising results. Soft bifocal contact lenses and peripheral defocus modifying lenses 
also have a role in control of myopia, but the lenses with a segmental design have no role, as the hyperopic defocus is still present in them. Those lenses with a concentric lens design create a myopic defocus and help in controlling the progression of myopia. Orthokeratology has a very effective role in controlling myopia progression. This is the orthokeratology lens placed onto the eye. This central base curve is flat and it flattens the corneal epithelium controlling the myopia. The peripheral reverse curve zone has space underneath where the corneal epithelium heaps up. So this concentric ring of heaped up corneal epithelium creates a myopic defocus which remains throughout the 24 hours and therefore orthokeratology has a very effective role in controlling myopia progression. Atropine has been shown to have a beneficial effect. 0.01% atropine has been found to have least rebound effect, best clinical efficacy and least side effect. Atropine acts in various ways, not just by inhibiting the accommodation. A direct influence of atropine on scleral, scleral fibroblasts is seen. Atropine has been found to inhibit myopia induction in avian eyes also. Avian eyes have nicotinic receptors. So it is thought that myopi, uh, atropine can act at very low doses and hence 0.01% atropine is very effective. Both atropine and orthokeratology are highly effective in controlling myopia progression. Orthokeratology, in addition, reverses the myopia, improves the unaided vision, and helps in removal of glasses. Children being spectacle-free can participate in outdoor games, which may again have a beneficial effect in control of myopia progression. So control of myopia progression has become a reality today. There is sufficient evidence in literature to show the efficacy of orthokeratology and atropin in slowing down myopia progression. As we take the next step in future, orthokeratology and atropin have the potential to flatten this curve of myopia. If it is made what's possible one day, it will be a small step for man, but a giant leap for the mankind. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shrikant. Uh, while Dr. Shreya is, uh, do you have one question? Yeah. I think they would be the best person. Uh, experts are already there, so maybe a quick comment from sir, maybe. What we are doing now for uh, screening for school going in children for refractive error per se, there is a big program is going on under government, very big program. But are we uh, justified in saying that we are covering the entire population of the children in screening? We are not doing it. And there is no compulsory program for that. Government is screening, but they are screening uh, now and then they are giving spectacles next year the children receive spectacles next year. So where is the gap? Even in that, we are not successful. And, uh, and if you are going to say this, all private schools are not going to comply. Now with your all your plus two and then need, they are not going to comply with your uh, outdoor activities. It's only the, uh, I, my thing is, the public, the parents should take it. And what, there was a new uh, recent paper saying that 
outdoor activities, even Saturday, Sunday, if they go out for at a stretch few hours, that helps. So there are so many logistics that uh, research has to be done before we come to this uh, uh, conclusion. I, this I think this uh, uh, just proposing right yeah, now. Yeah, we Parental, yeah. wherever is possible by all of us here, wherever is possible in our own region, our own place, try to create awareness. I think we have a myopia symposium for this and uh, maybe these questions can be well answered that time. Oh, we have a last speaker who has left. Dr. Shreya has yeah, left not actually. This. Not this. She's come back actually. Oh. So I think, okay. Thank you. So Dr. Shreya, you can quickly. Uh, different topic since when we are discussing since morning, I'm just going to talk on plepharophimosis syndrome. Uh, for allowing me to speak uh, last. Thank you, ma'am, for adjusting my time. I'm just going to speak on blepharophimosis syndrome. We all know which is a syndrome, which consists of uh, blepharophimosis, that is shortening of horizontal palpebral fissure, ptosis, shortening of vertebral palpebral fissure, uh, epicanthus inverses, and telecanthus, the distance between two canthi, and sometimes associated with ectropion or can be associated with tear duct abnormalities also and sometime patient come with uh, adulthood age with uh, lots of ectropion uh, this is uh, there can be some gonadal atrophy also and mental retardation along with that and it's purely genetical so more than 85 percent of cases there will be a mutation of uh, gene foxl2 at 3 q23 arm and uh, that is it is a mostly autosomal dominant and it penetrates 50 50 percent uh, till date, there is only one recessive mutation has been noted for FOXL2 in India, uh, which is very, very rare. And it has got two types. One is all the features I said, and the second feature along with the uh, gonadal deficiency. So prevalence still, I have searched so many literature, it is not known. In our hospital, Trusty Netrala, we found 29 patients of blepharophimosis syndrome. So again, it has... Uh, uh, said one in 50,000, so that is matching 0.006% we found. Out of that, 23 were presented as a children and nine, uh, six as an adult. 25 were male and four were female. Um, aims the for the treatment here is prevent amblyopia, prevent neck muscle hypertrophy, field of vision, uh, especially medial, and then cosmetic, and finally comes the symptomatic, whatever is left for, and the treatment is purely surgical. So preoperative evaluation is must. We have to measure the interpupillary distance, intercanthal distance, horizontal papillary fissure, vertical papillary fissure, medial limbus to medial canthus, and lateral lim limbus to lateral canthus. We have three steps to do. There's one is uh, middle canthoplasty. We have available techniques are these three, lateral canthotomy and dosis correction. But to correct this, we must know the equation. So uh, usually intercanthal inter distance is equal to half of interpupillary distance. So when we correct, correction needed in each eye is one half of pre-op of ICD by one half of IPD. So for instance, in this patient, if IPD is 58 millimeter, ICD is 37.5 millimeter, we need to correct 4.25 millimeter in each eye. To get this correction, the ratio for the tissue excision is to be two is to three. So we need to excise in this particular patient 6.37 millimeter in each eye and moreover we can just uh, lengthen the horizontal papillary fissure along with that with the lateral canthotomy uh, uh, available. So this is simple CU blast uh, U uh, technique and that is a horn blast technique uh, for the medial canthal epicanthus inverses and this is a YV plasty. So in this patient usually when we open we have to found, find out proper medial canthal tendon and then in this patient I had did YV plasty for skin and tissue and then medial canthal res resection also because we wanted more correction in this patient. So we found out the medial canthal tendon properly and then we uh, cut it with non-absorbable suture and then uh, we just uh, excise the excess tissue and then suture in a V pattern. So that is the way we can do epicanthus inverses correction uh, in a medial canthoplasty. There can be a Z plasty or double Z plasty. So you just press place the incision in this way and then suture. So previously we put the incision in this way and then when we suture it corrects. 
lateral canthotomy simply canthotomy works well uh, we it can be done with fornicial correction or without fornicial correction this is a with fornicial correction bra suspension everybody knows we have so many available techniques each has got its own advantage and disadvantage this is simple silicon transplant silicon sling done in this patient we can have our own technique we are fixing the tracer plate to silicon also so medial canthoplasty followed by ptosis correction or in our rural area especially patient comes for the ptosis correction first and then later on she came when became adult came for the medial canthoplasty so we have to take care whatever patient wants and then in this patient they do they don't he didn't want anything except correction of the lateral ectropion so that we did complication definitely can be a infection of the implant can be a uh, complication related to leg of thalamus unequal correction scar is the most dreaded complication patient are taking care so you need to counsel the patient before patient taking the patient in so my take home message is amblyopia correction is at most important aim in this patient cosmetic you have to balance between these two see what patient and relative wants meticulous planning and pre operative counseling for the scar is at most important i wish you all have happy patients uh, to you thanks to my patients thanks to my teachers and thank you thank you shreya for uh, complying the, com uh, the uh, time you have saved one or two minutes also so uh, <laughs> still the crowd is there i just noted one point uh, in rop i mean don't restrict yourself to check only the integrity of the retina you just have uh, an eye to look for the visual milestones development so any deviation that occurs is just immediately or don't wait for the preemies or the sick babies to wait to develop the normalcy so just have a, uh, a check out on that and then refer uh, or treat start treating accordingly that's what uh, one thing that i wanted to convey to the audience here thank you very much thank you uh, all the speakers and the audience for patient hearing